Hi, I'm Justin Mitchell from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Today I'm going to talk about medial meniscus root repair with the suture lock implant, and we're going to discuss our early outcomes and clinical rationale utilizing some case presentations. Our first case example is a 42-year-old female. She had acute left knee pain after a hyperflexion injury while skiing. She has no previous history of surgery or injuries, and she works as a physician. She's a very active skier, skiing 40 plus days per year, and she also does yoga, Pilates, and CrossFit. She presented to our clinic with an antalgic gait with a range of motion ranging from zero to 130 degrees, which was limited by pain. She had medial joint line tenderness and a positive McMurray's medially. She had posterior medial knee pain with deep flexion as well. Her radiographs demonstrated no obvious evidence of osteoarthritis or any other bony injury, but her MRI demonstrated a posterior medial meniscus root tear. You can see this both on the axial and sagittal views, especially on the sagittal view with our ghost sign. Intraoperatively, we were able to see a posterior medial meniscus root tear, which reduced nicely to the anatomic position of the root. So at this point, a root repair is indicated. So when looking at surgical considerations for meniscus root repair, one of the things we look at is the idea of joint line fixation. If we think back to the idea of working length or working distance, one of the benefits of having joint line fixation with an implant directly adjacent to our repair site is that it can improve our biomechanical properties and our construct strength. In addition, we would like to have a secure, low-profile knotless construct, the ability to easily tension and retension our knotless construct, and an efficient and reproducible technique in our operative suite. The Suture Lock implant is an innovative product that hits all of these necessities. It's a soft, all-suture implant with two knotless repair sutures. There's a small 2.4 millimeter drill, which creates a small tunnel for passage of the implant, and it allows for stronger fixation and less gap formation compared to our traditional repair. This is a reproducible technique for efficiency in our OR. Here we see a technique preview for our suture lock implant. This is an all knotless implant with two repair sutures that can pass through our proximal anchor fixation. This implant can be passed in a proximal to distal direction at our root repair site through the small 2.4 millimeter tunnel. Once the implant is passed, it can then be secured proximally at the joint line. In this diagram, we see an important tip and technical point for this implant. You can see that we've placed a clamp distally around the distal aspect of the implant. This allows us to pass our repair sutures and our passing sutures out of a working portal without prematurely unloading our implant. Here we can see a technical preview of how the implant itself works. You can see here our first repair suture is passed through the meniscus itself and then shuttled through our first passing suture. This is then shuttled down the implant to allow for securing of our first suture. Once that is completed, the second suture can then be passed in a very similar fashion. Once both sutures have been passed through the implant, this allows for knotless tensioning and retensioning of the device such that we can create an anatomic meniscus root repair. So back to our surgical case. Here is our meniscus root tear that we can see off of the posterior medial meniscus root. We can see that the root is unstable and requires repair. In these instances, I typically utilize a small curette to create a small bony bleeding bed for anatomic repair. We then can utilize the Arthrex point-to-point -point meniscal repair guide, which allows for placement of our 2.4 millimeter pin in the exact correct position to create an anatomic repair. Once we have confirmed that the drill is in the correct position, we can then pass a wire through the drill cannula, which allows for passage of our suture lock implant. Utilizing the wire for passage, our suture lock is then passed in a proximal to distal direction such that it can be brought into the drill tunnel. With passing the suture lock into the tunnel, we can then see the most proximal aspect of the implant. And once that proximal aspect of the implant is adjacent to our tunnel, we can slowly dunk that implant just below the surface of the proximal tibia, allowing for fixation at the joint line. Tugging upon the implant reveals excellent joint line fixation. Once the repair suture is confirmed to be in the appropriate position, we then use our passing suture to shuttle the repair suture down our implant. You can see that as we shuttle this repair suture, the meniscus goes from having slack on it or having some laxity to a more taut and anatomic position. We can then take our second repair suture and pass it in a very similar fashion. Once this repair suture is passed, it is then shuttled down the implant utilizing our passing suture. Again, you can see how this very nicely tensions the meniscus in an anatomic position. Once our sutures are fully secured in the appropriate position, you can then see the ability to not only tension, but also retension the implant such that we can create an excellent anatomic meniscus root repair. Following repair, 
Our post-operative rehabilitation consists of non-weight bearing for six weeks. We allow early range of motion from zero to 90 degrees for the first two weeks. Full range of motion is then allowed thereafter with a focus on quad strengthening and minimizing muscle atrophy. We allow a return to full ambulation without crutches beginning at six weeks. Then we transition to light cardiovascular fitness activity at three months, which can include swimming or elliptical activities, and then a return to running and jogging at four and a half months. Our goal is full return to activity by six months. You can see in the video, one of our early patients who received a repair utilizing the suture lock implant is now walking normally without an antalgic gait and has no obvious evidence of which knee actually had surgery. So the natural question is, does modifying our technique matter? The literature and available data is inconsistent. Some papers demonstrate excellent outcomes, while others show that the outcomes are not as good as we would like them to be and are at the level of a salvage procedure. So we know that the incidence of complications after isolated meniscal root repair is approximately 10%. The most common complication is progressive degeneration and repair failure was reported in approximately 3% of patients. We also know that when we examine the efficacy of meniscus root repair, we do see generally improved biomechanical and patient reported outcomes. But unfortunately, repairs do not significantly improve meniscal extrusion in many cases, and approximately 6% of patients progress to some degree of osteoarthritis. Because of this, we do know that there is room for improvement in our repair techniques. So does the ability to retention matter? I would submit to you the answer is yes. We know that cyclic displacement can be a problem after meniscus root repair. Testing different suture configurations with our standard root repair technique demonstrates that displacement does happen and happens somewhere between 1.78 and 3.1 millimeters away from the desired anatomic repair location. Although all techniques demonstrated ultimate load to failure above the currently adopted rehabilitation force threshold, we know that this displacement can be problematic. We see that with simulated rehabilitation, we can see unrecoverable loosening from rehabilitative loading occurring in single and double tunnel meniscal root repairs. Root repairs also gradually displaced with continued loading instead of reaching an equilibrium. So displacement is a problem. We know that if we have displacement, we are then encountering a repair which is no longer anatomic. And we know that achieving an anatomic repair is crucially important for our results. We know that anatomic repair results in a 17% reduction in contact area, more closely approximating the native knee. Non-anatomic repairs, however, increase the mean and peak contact pressures 13 and 26% respectively compared to the intact knee. So, we must get it anatomic and we must keep it there. Here's a second case example from another patient that drives this point home. This is a 50-year-old gentleman who had acute knee pain while shoveling snow four months prior. He has daily pain, which rates a seven to an eight out of 10, and he had no previous surgery or injuries. He has an increased BMI of 53.2, and he is a laborer. He also has to take care of several children and work on cars at home. We can see from his MRI that he has a posterior medial meniscus root tear, and this is actually a tear that is a root equivalent tear just adjacent to the root, which we know is a very complicated and complex tear pattern. He was indicated for surgery, and on arthroscopy, we can see a confirmation of this root adjacent tear. Given the nature of the injury, as well as the patient's pain and dysfunction, he was indicated for a repair. We utilized the suture lock implant to achieve an anatomic repair in this situation. You can see that we are able to not only tension, but also retension the repair to achieve a near anatomic result in this very complicated and difficult repair pattern. In addition, we then chose to utilize adjunctive fixation utilizing a fiber stitch all inside meniscus repair suture device. This allows for adjunctive and orthogonal fixation to help with load sharing and prevent displacement. Following repair, this patient did well early on postoperatively, but unfortunately he was unable to follow postoperative rehabilitation protocols for family and work reasons. He progressed to full weight bearing immediately after surgery, and although it was not recommended, he presented to his first post-operative appointment on a single cane bearing full weight. Even despite this, his pain was reduced and he reported it as a three out of 10, and he was off of all of his narcotic pain medication. We recommended he continue with PT and he was able to continue with intermittent physical therapy, and he is now three months out from the procedure and is reporting zero out of 10 pain with a nearly normal gait. This case demonstrates the ability of the suture lock implant to withstand the rigors of daily life. Even in early weight bearing, early loading, this implant is performing well and the patient is having a good outcome even despite the inability to be off of his knee.
Cases like these suggest that we may be able to advance our rehabilitation protocols earlier than previously expected because this implant has improved biomechanical and structural properties. These cases and our early outcomes demonstrate that the suture lock implant solves many of the pitfalls associated with traditional meniscal root repair. Consistent anatomic repair is possible, and we have the ability not only to tension, but also retension our constructs to ensure anatomic repairs. Given the increased strength and decreased gap formation that we see with the suture lock implant, we may be able to modify our rehabilitation protocols in the future. Early results at our institution have been promising and encouraging.